and from our wellbeing, uh, wellbeing morning tea at the Wellbeing Centre. Um, I have been down there and I can report that there are some delicious muffins and fruit and drinks, um, which is very much appreciated. We are doing a live webinar today on advanced care planning. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I am on the Wurundjeri um, lands of, of the Kulin Nation, and I would like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. My name is Sonia Fullerton. I'm the Deputy Chief Medical Officer here at Peter Mac, and I'm joined today by our, one of our fabulous consumer representatives, Holly Bratton. Wave, Holly. <laughs> Excellent. Um, she is going to give us um, the benefit of our experience um, with advanced care planning for this Advanced Care Planning Week webinar for 2022. Advanced Care Planning Week is put on by Advanced Care Planning Australia every year just to highlight um, our thoughts and um, needs around Advanced Care Planning Australia. Today we are broadcasting from Victoria and I'm mostly going to use the terms that we use in Victoria. We're in a federation and so some of the terms that we use in different states are different. So in Victoria we talk about medical treatment decision makers and advanced directives. If you're in other states, you, you might use terms such as substitute decision maker or advanced care directive. Um, at the end, I'll give you the link to Advanced Care Planning Australia webpage, um, which is fantastic to use for getting forms and terms from, from different um, states. So please feel free to use the chat function on Zoom to ask us any questions throughout the session, and we'll do our best to try and answer them. I'd like to hand over to Holly now. Um, I'm really excited to have Holly here because we doctors do a lot of talking about Advanced Care Planning Australia, but it was really interesting for me to hear about Holly's lived experience of learning about Advanced Care Planning Australia. And she's going to tell us why the first time she heard about it, she thought it was a terrible idea. Um, but now as she's come to learn more about it, um, she is a bit more of a fan than she was before. So over to you, Holly. Thank you, Sonia, and hello to everyone watching, and thank you all again for having me here today. My name's Holly, and unfortunately, I was diagnosed with a rare type of blood cancer called mixed phenotype leukemia. This is traces of both the fast-growing acute myeloid and acute lymphoblastic leukemic cells in the body. There wasn't any time to wait. I instantly endured countless procedures such as lumbar punches, bone marrow biopsies, pick slash Hickman line insertions, as well as numerous rounds of chemotherapy. This really knocked me for six. I was so sick. Not long after being diagnosed, I was informed that I would need to undergo a bone marrow transplant. This process can take months to years, but fortunately, one of my brothers was my 100% match. Had he not have been a match, I would have needed an alternate donor, which is in most cases sourced from overseas. This takes time in itself, but also given the fact that I was diagnosed right at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, where coronavirus was very unknown, they put a hold on overseas donations immediately. This would have greatly impacted and hindered my survival rate, being I was only permitted to have a 50% match at that time. Once it was apparent that my brother was an 100% match for my bone marrow donation, he underwent preparation. This is also a lengthy process in itself, not only for the person receiving, but the person donating the cells. I look back now on my ongoing journey and remember clear as day before getting admitted for my life-saving transplant, mum and I attended a small class of about seven patients and a social worker. This meeting was about a few things, but one in particular was about advanced care planning. Not knowing what this actually meant, at the start, I instantly dismissed what was being said and turned straight to mum and said, I'm not doing this, I'm not going to die. My emotions were through the roof at this time and I honestly didn't know what to think about it all. Throughout my treatment, my family were my absolute rocks, but in particular, my mum. She never left my side and was there for me before I woke up in the morning and was there till I went to sleep at night. We spoke endlessly, played games and just enjoyed each other's company the best we could given the circumstances. Until one day I woke up and got told the dreaded news that my mum had just been diagnosed with bowel cancer. Our family these last few years have really been through hell and back with a number of things happened during this time, 
but it has only brought us closer as a family and we now treasure the time we have together more than we did before. Honestly, don't have the words to say how grateful I am and always will be for not only my entire family, but in particular, my mum. The reason behind me telling you this is that at that moment, I lost not only my rock, but my second voice. Mum and I spoke about what I ideally wanted out of treatment and she knew everything that I wanted moving forward. And that was to do everything and anything to keep me here and keep fighting. Again, it's not till now that I look back and think, I wish I took more notice of what was being said at the meeting rather than jumping straight to conclusions and dismissing it altogether. Because what if something happened while my mum was going through her journey fighting cancer and no one else really knew what I wanted moving forward? What if I needed someone else to make those decisions for me? Would they really know what I wanted? And that's a question I ask myself to this day. Advanced care planning to me means I have the right to speak up and tell the doctors what treatment I would like moving forward in my journey. It's also about nominating that someone who can speak on your behalf if you're unable to and adhere to your preferences, values and beliefs. It's honestly, ideally all about you. As I keep moving forward in life and battling little battles of life after cancer, every opportunity I would recommend advanced care planning to everyone. I'm guilty myself of dismissing it at the start as I definitely had the wrong impression of what was actually being told to me when in fact, it is so much more than that. Before I hand back over to Sonia, I just wanna say thank you to everyone listening today and how incredible you all are fighting your individual battles daily. Whether you're a patient, carer of a family member, of someone fighting the hard battle or a friend, keep pushing through. You're all so much stronger than you think. So Sonia, back to you. But how would you explain what advanced care planning is? Oh, thanks, Holly. That's such a powerful um, story. Um, the reason, um, one of the reasons I think it's so interesting, um, my day job is as a palliative care doctor. And so sometimes when I talk to people about advanced care planning, they get a big fright and they say, does this mean I'm, I'm dying? You know, why are you talking to me about this stuff? But if you'd done an advanced care plan at that time, you would have written down, I want to have curative treatment. I want to have, you know, every treatment that's offered to me. It doesn't matter if it makes me feel terrible. My goal is cure. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. And everyone's wishes that you put down in an advanced care plan might be different. So some of the patients that I look after, their disease is not curable. And they might say, well, what I really want in my care is that I want to be at home or I want to be with my dog or um, I want to make sure that I don't have any pain. So everyone's wishes are kind of different. So thank you so much for that story. It's so powerful. Oh, Marie, thank you. Um, but now I'm going to answer the actual question, was, which is, what is advanced care planning? And this is how I talk to people about it at work. If you were unwell and the doctors couldn't speak to you about what medical care you wanted or you didn't want, who would speak for you and what would they say? So the technical definition of advanced care planning is a process by which a person can indicate their preferences for future healthcare based on their preferences, values and beliefs. So that's one of those definitions that we give. But it comes down to if you were sick, you were so sick that you couldn't talk to the doctors about your medical treatment decisions, who would make those decisions for you? And that's what we in Victoria, we call that the medical treatment decision maker. And it has other names in other states. And what would they say? So this is a process by which you talk to your family and your medical treatment decision maker about the sorts of values and preferences that you might have. And you can also write them down in an advanced directive. So I've chucked a lot of terms around already. So I wanted to just go through a few definitions um, just so that we were all clear about what we're talking about. So a medical treatment decision maker, um, this is the new word that we use in Victoria, and it means the person who makes medical treatment decisions for you if you're so sick and you can't make them yourself. There's a little bit of confusion around this for a couple of reasons. Uh, we used to call this a medical power of attorney, and so often I use both of those words when I'm talking to people. And the other important thing about the medical treatment decision maker is they only make decisions if the person can't make them themselves. So sometimes in the hospital, someone will come to me and say, I'm the medical treatment decision maker or I'm the medical power of attorney and this is what I want you to do with my mum. And then I will say, no, no, your mother has got capacity to make her own medical decisions. So we talk to her, the patient, about medical treatment decisions. 
If she loses capacity, that's when we talk to you. So the important thing is that the medical treatment decision maker only makes decisions if the person cannot make them themselves. And this person, medical treatment decision maker, can be appointed legally with a form, but if there's no one appointed, we choose them from a list. So that's an important point that we're going to talk a little bit more about later. Um, an advanced directive is a legal form, and in Victoria and in the other states as well, we have two types. One is a values directive, and that's when you, Holly, would say things like, um, I want to get cured. The most important thing for me is to overcome my cancer, and I don't care if I lose my hair, I, I vomit for a month, that's fine. I just want to have that treatment because my goal is cure. So those are the sorts of things that you might write in a values directive. An instructional directive is a really powerful instrument and it consents to or refuses treatment that you could be offered. Uh, a common one in, in the people that I work with would be, I don't want to have cardiopulmonary resuscitation, so I refuse CPR. If you write that in an instructional directive, I as your doctor am not allowed to give you CPR. So it's very powerful and very strong. Um, the I try to steer people towards a values directive rather than an instructional directive. And here is why. Say um, if someone was really sick, they fell over and they broke their leg and they had an advance in instructional directive that said, I don't want to have an operation, um, then I actually wouldn't be able to go ahead and fix their broken leg, even though that's not really what they meant in the instructional directive. So I'd prefer that person wrote a values directive and described their values and preferences, and then I can make a good decision using those values and preferences if something unexpected happens. And the last term I want to mention is advanced care plan. And this is confusing, so many different words for so many different things, but I think an advanced care plan is any sort of advanced care planning document. So that could be when you appoint a medical treatment decision maker, or you write an advanced directive, or you write a letter that contains your values and preferences, or your doctor at Peter Mac writes a note in, in your medical record expressing what your, your values are. Um, all of those could form part of an advanced care plan. So Sonia, who should I choose to be my medical treatment decision maker? That is a very good question. And luckily I have a slide that I prepared earlier to answer that. Um, often people will instinctively want to choose someone, the person that's closest to them in their family. But it is good just to think about the best person to be your medical treatment decision maker. It's got to be someone that you trust. It has to be someone that will represent your, your wishes. So um, in the past, when I've talked with people about their, their family member who's, who's very ill and dying because I work as a palliative care doctor, um, sometimes people will say to me, look, I know my mum wouldn't want any of this, but I just can't bear to let her go. And then I'll say to that person, no, no, I'm so sorry. It's, you know, with the greatest respect, it's not about what you want. Your job is to represent to me your mum's wishes, what your mum would want. And then we talk about, you know, their mother's values and preferences. So the person you choose as your medical treatment decision maker must understand that their job is to represent your, your wishes and values, you, you the patient. Um, so the, we're imagining a scenario in which the patient is very unwell and can't state what their values and their preferences and their decisions are themselves. Um, the person needs to be, um, like, you know, reasonably confident and articulate. Um, some people might say they need to speak English. That's not the case. We can always get an interpreter. That's not a problem at all. Um, and people often also ask me, can you have more than one person or is it just one? And you definitely can appoint more than one, but we there's a list and we will go to person one and we will think, is this person able, willing and available? If not, then we will move to the next, next person on the list. So those are a few sorts of things um, that we might think about. So I can give you an example just for me. Um, I've got some young adult children who are 18 and, and 20. 
Um, so technically, if I didn't appoint anyone, it would be my 21 year old son who would be my medical treatment decision maker. I don't think that's fair. You know, he's really just a very young person. And so I've appointed a friend of mine who's a really senior nurse to be my medical treatment decision maker because I'm 100% certain that she would represent my views. And I don't want my children to have the burden of having to make any difficult decisions if I got really sick. What happens if I don't do an ACP? You don't have to do an ACP. <laughs> of course, I want everyone to do an ACP, but you actually don't have to. It's not, it's not mandatory at all. Um, people, I think people sometimes get a little bit off put by the documents. They think that, that, you know, it's a bit burdensome and it's complicated. It's actually, it's actually really not. They are quite simple. Um, if you don't do an, any sort of advanced care planning, if you got sick, say you got coronavirus and you went into the emergency department, you were really, really, really sick and you hadn't done any advanced care planning and you couldn't make a decision for yourself, then the doctors would go through a list that's given to us in the law to work out who would be the person to make decisions for you. And then we'll approach the first person on the list and say, you know, um, your brother or your husband or whoever is, is really unwell, we want to make some medical treatment decisions and we need to ask you what your relative would want. And often that person might not know. And that can be an incredibly stressful situation for them because they need to try to guess what the person's wishes would have been and they don't know. And so sometimes they can feel really guilty. Um, so I think it's a good idea to select who you want to be your medical treatment decision maker and to appoint them legally with a form if you need to and then um, have a discussion with them about what your wishes and preferences could be and this could take place over Christmas dinner when you're sitting around and chatting about you know what happened to Auntie Audrey and um, how she went through her health care you just need to let your family and your medical treatment decision maker know what your wishes might be if you got really sick. Um, and then the next step, um, if you would like to, is to go ahead and write those down on a piece of paper and distribute those advanced care plans to people who are involved with your care. It's really, um, it, gives, it gives you control over what happens. If you don't do an advanced care plan, we, the doctors, proceed as we want to in terms of finding the person to speak to. And then we ask that person that, that we've picked, what your wishes are, but they might not know. So if you do an advanced care plan, it means that you maintain control over your medical treatment decisions, even if in the future, you don't have capacity to make those decisions yourself, your wishes and your voice is still heard in those medical treatment decisions. So I think it's a good idea. That means we don't just have to guess what you would want. Um, we know what you might want. The other thing that it, about not doing advanced care planning is that um, when we're looking for someone to make a medical treatment decision, I just wanted to show you this list of, of how we do it. So let's assume that someone's um, rocked into the emergency department um, very unwell and they haven't appointed a medical treatment decision maker. Um, and we need to make a medical decision. So we will then look at this hierarchy and think, have they appointed someone as their medical treatment decision maker or medical power of attorney? Um, no, they haven't. Um, is there a guardian appointed by BCAT? No, that's very uncommon. And then we go through this list. Who's the first of these persons who's in a close and continuing relationship? And that means it can't be your estranged husband who lives in Canada. Um, it's got to be someone who's in a close and continuing relationship with you. The first person is your spouse um, or your partner. Um, you don't have to be married, just the person that you, you're in a, in, a, in a relationship with. The next person in the list would be your primary carer. That's not someone that you pay to look after you like a nurse. It would be um, the person who cares for you. Then um, adult children, parent or adult sibling. And if there's more than one of those category, then we take the oldest of those person. So often people will say to me, oh, well, of course it would be my husband who'd be my medical treatment decision maker if I became unwell. And then I let them know, that's wonderful. I'm going to write that in a note. 
but you don't have to do any forms because um, if you appointed, uh, if you didn't appoint your husband as your medical team decision maker, they're going to be the person we talk to anyway. But say you were married, um, but you actually wanted your adult child to make the decisions, then it would be a great idea to legally appoint that person. So I've heard about the medical power of attorney. Can you just clarify, Sonia, what's the difference between the medical power of attorney and the medical treatment decision maker? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, most people refer to this person um, who makes decisions if you don't have capacity as the medical power of attorney or enduring power of attorney medical because that was the old legislation. But in 2018, the laws changed. And so now in Victoria, we call this person a medical treatment decision maker. And then people get worried because they think, oh, I did appoint a medical power of attorney. Um, do I need to do the whole thing again? Because that's a bit boring. Um, but no, you don't. If you've appointed a medical power of attorney under the old laws, then they now become your medical treatment decision maker under the new laws. So if you've already appointed a medical power of attorney, you don't need to worry, you're totally covered. But it is a good idea to make sure that all the people involved in your care have copies of those documents. And I'll give you some um, the ways to do that at the end as well. So how do I actually do an advanced care plan? Um, can I tell you a funny story? I went to a two-day training once on advanced care planning and um, at the end I walked out with a folder this thick and I remember walking out as a reasonably intelligent person who's done lots of study at university and thinking I actually, after all of this talking and all of this learning, I still don't actually know how to do it. And that's why I love this, um, this slide here. How do I actually do advanced care planning? And all you have to do is remember ACP. So A is a point. That's when you choose the person that you want to act as your medical treatment decision maker. So if you were unwell, you couldn't talk to the doctors about what treatment you wanted or you didn't want, who would speak for you? So that's, that's the first thing. Who's your person? Next, chat. You need to talk to that person and to your rest of your family and to your treating teams about your, the sorts of values and preferences that you have. So if it's me, I would say to my family, oh, gosh, you know, for me, the most important thing is my cognition, my having my brain working well, um, being able to spend time with family and friends and um, be on the internet and social media and things like that. If I wasn't able to do that, for me, my life is not worth living. And for, for everyone, it's a little bit different. So C is for chatting to your family about what your values and preferences are. P is put it on paper. Unfortunately, even in our digitalized world, um, these, these forms still need to be uh, written with a pen on paper and signed by various witnesses. So putting it on paper means that your voice, your wishes are really directly heard in the future if you lose capacity to make decisions. Um, so it's a really good idea to put it on paper. And then the important bit after that is to then distribute it to, um, to other people so that they can make sure that they know what your wishes are. Um, so the put it on paper bit, the advanced directive forms there's two forms appointment of medical treatment decision maker and advanced directive form and the advanced directive form has to be signed by a doctor to make sure that it makes medical sense um, with a witness as well um, it's really important to give the bits of paper if you do them to all the people involved in your care um, if you're a Peter Mac patient we definitely want a copy of those documents your GP wants a copy, your family wants a copy, and if you have a community palliative care team as a palliative care doctor, um, they would want a copy as well. Um, and the two forms are the advanced directive and the appointment of medical treatment decision maker. If you're not watching from Victoria, then jump onto the advanced care planning website there, the links down the bottom. Um, it's a great website and they've got different um, sections for each state. So if you're watching from Queensland, jump on there and you can see all the different forms that are relevant in Queensland. Um, if you are from Queensland and you come to me with forms from Queensland, I will absolutely look at them and I will definitely not ignore them, but you're in a slightly stronger legal position if you have forms from your own state. Ooh. 
So again, what happens if I don't appoint anybody to be my medical treatment decision maker? That's really common, actually. Like most people haven't appointed someone and it's okay. We will go through that um, that hierarchy. In fact, I might have even put that. Oh, here we go. Yeah, we will, we will go by this hierarchy to work out who to make medical decisions. So if number one, you don't have anyone appointed, and I'm presuming that you don't have a guardian appointed by a VCAT, um, then we will go through this list and find the first person who's in a close and continuing relationship and who's um, ready, able, and willing to make a decision. So we, we will do our very best to pick the person that we think can represent your wishes the best, but you lose a little bit of power because it's me making the decision, it's not you making the decision about, about who that person is. And here I've just got a picture of that form, um, the appointment of medical treatment decision maker. And this is where you will write your personal details, write down the details of the medical treatment decision maker. Yeah, so that's one of the forms that hopefully I will be encouraging you all to, uh, to indulge in today. Um, one of the things that's important is that um, um, even if we go ahead and do all of, all of this process, we make an advanced care plan or an advanced directive, um, but the information is not disseminated, is not spread to all of the different institutions, things can go wrong. And I just wanted to um, mention um, this, this um, patient whose details have been changed, obviously, to preserve their um, anonymity, but um, she was a lady um, who came to Peter Mac and she was very unwell and she'd been looked after by, um, by my team, the palliative care team and the community palliative care team um, in, in the suburb where she lived. She really understood very well that she had advanced cancer and she didn't have that long to live. So she, with her um, GP and with the community palliative care team, she wrote an advanced directive and in it she said that she didn't want to have cardiopulmonary resuscitation great decision because if you're very unwell with advanced cancer, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, you know, jumping on someone's chest like you see on TV is not effective and it can be very distressing. So she properly said to us, you know, I don't really want to have um, CPR and she wrote that in an advanced directive. Uh, but when she got sick and came into hospital, um, we didn't know that she'd done this advanced directive. We didn't have a copy of it. And um, when she deteriorated, our emergency team swung into action and she did actually end up having um, some life support treatment given to her at that time. Um, and it was really distressing to our staff because um, we later found out that she had not wanted those treatments that we gave her in an emergency. We felt that we were doing the right thing. If we had known that she had that advanced directive, we 100% would not have done that. We would not impose treatment on someone who, who didn't want it. And so um, I, this was one of the impetuses for um, a team of people from, from work, from Peter Mac, to try to improve our processes around advanced care planning um, because we want to make sure that if someone has got wishes and values and preferences that they've written down, that we know about them and we have their, that in our medical record. So if you do do some forms, if you appoint a medical treatment decision maker or you write an advanced directive, it's really important to communicate that with health providers. So your GP, um, Peter Mac, if you come here, any local hospitals, because if you get crook and you don't live in Parkville, you're likely to go to your local emergency department. Um, and also to um, any community palliative care teams that are involved with your care. I have to say that because I'm a palliative care doctor. Um, but the other thing that people um, may not realise is you can upload your advanced directives to your My Health record. Um, and that way it's visible to any health service that you went to in the whole of Australia. How many medical treatment decision makers can one person have? Um, you definitely can appoint more than one, but we only talk to one at a time. If I were, sometimes often people make decisions by consensus, really. It's not just one person that makes the decision. And so people might say, well, I want my, um, my son and my daughter to make this decision. And um, technically, legally, we just talk to one person at a time, but you might write in your values directive, um, these are the people... Um, oh, my phone's ringing. That's very alarming. Um, these are the people that I want to be involved in, in the decisions. 
um, sorry. Um, so it, you might say, um, I appoint my son and second will be my daughter, but you might write in your values directive, um, I would like my son and my daughter to be involved together in the decisions. Um, and again, if you haven't appointed someone, that's fine. We will just choose someone from that list that's given to us by the law. Um, and also it's a bit flexible because say you appointed your husband or wife, but then they became unwell themselves and they weren't able to fulfill that role. Um, then we would just move to the next person um, on your list or the next person in the hierarchy if they're not able to, um, to um, fulfill that role. Right. Now I'm trying to look in the chat to see if there are any questions or comments. We'd love to have any questions from you. Have you got any other questions from me, Holly, that I haven't talked about so far? No, that's, you've covered pretty much everything, um, which is great. Um, I'm very informed now. <laughs> it's fantastic. I think um, one of the other things that I was going to mention is um, sometimes it can be um, confusing as to um, what happens in an emergency. So in an emergency, if you got hit by a bus and you went to the emergency department, um, we're allowed to proceed with emergency treatment for you. Um, we don't have to get too worried about who, whether you've appointed someone and who's appointed, but usually things are not an emergency. Um, so we have a little bit more time to work, to work things out. Oh, I've got a question. What can't I put in my advanced care plan? That is an excellent question. Thank you. Um, you can't put illegal stuff in your advanced care plan. So, um, and um, you can put, well, you can put anything you like in your advanced care plan, but I, as your treating doctor, don't have to do it if it's illegal. Or, and I don't have to offer you treatment that is futile. So I had a patient once, um, actually, this was a family member. So um, a family member who, who wasn't very aware of, uh, of, of healthcare and how things worked. And they had cancer that had spread to their brain. And, and they said, is it possible to have a brain transplant, for example? And um, it's not. So even if that person had said, I want to have any treatment up to and including a brain transplant, I, I'm then not able to offer them a brain transplant. It, it doesn't happen. So, um, so you can put what you like in your advanced directive, but if it's illegal, I don't have to do it. Or if it's futile, I don't have to do it. Um, now, uh, we have legalised voluntary assisted dying in Victoria. And so you, you definitely can um, put a request um, to say that, you know, that's something that you would like to consider. But because you need to have good, perfect cognitive capacity, brain function to be able to request voluntary assisted dying, it's not helpful to put that in your advanced directive because your advanced directive only comes into play after you've lost capacity. So there's different, you can put what you like in, but different things will be listened to or not according to the circumstances. I've got one, Sonia. Yeah. How long does an ACP actually last? Oh, it lasts forever. And we do find that people's values and preferences remain pretty stable throughout their life. If you change your mind, though, all you need to do is do a new advanced care plan and you can revoke the old one so that it's not valid anymore. If you do that, though, make sure you communicate that widely because if a person has a copy of your old one and they don't know you've got a new one, then um, that could be a bit tricky. I'm loving these questions. They're really good. Uh, do the copies distributed to health professionals need to be certified copies? No, they don't. Perfect. Mm. Um, but distributing copies is something that's really important. So when I'm at work and I'm doing an advanced care directive with someone, um, I go through the, the plan with them. I make sure that it makes um, sense medically, that they haven't, um, you know, that, that it makes, makes sense to everyone. And um, then I, after I've signed it and we have to get a witness in to sign, I run off to the photocopy, whiz it through the photocopier and make five copies. And then I just take one for our medical records at Peter Mac and I make a note to make sure that the other, other doctors and nurses can see it. And then I hand those other five copies to the person and I ask them to distribute them to their GP, um, to their other local hospitals, to any nursing teams looking after them. So, no, they don't need to be certified copies. Yeah. 
who needs an ACP? So I would say, of course, technically I want to say everyone, but actually what I want to say is that if you um, know who the person is, um, who you would want to make medical decisions for you, um, if it's not that person in the hierarchy, then you should appoint them. And you should just make sure that that person and your family knows what your wishes are. It's happened to me a lot of times. I've been down in the emergency department and I've been looking at a patient who's, for example, got melanoma and they're having immunotherapy and they've been so hopeful of having a cure that they hadn't wanted to talk about what would happen if things go wrong. And so they have been so hopeful that they felt like to talk about it would put a bit of a moz on the situation. And so they haven't talked about their wishes and values. So um, it's really stressful for their family. So I think that anyone um, uh, who has, has a health condition, is older, should definitely think about this. Um, I have an advanced direct, I have an advanced directive for the reason that I mentioned earlier that I want to just protect my young adult children from having to make any decisions. So I think I think most people should do some thinking about making an advanced care plan. It doesn't necessarily have to be a formal written legal directive, um, but just to have a chat with your friends and family about what you want. Um, There's another one that's come through, Sonia. Yeah. Cultural needs can be included in ACP, example, yes. going home to die or going back to the country, which is quite important um, in the Aboriginal culture. Absolutely. So that's the sort of thing that we want to see written down in the values directive. And there's questions about that, you know, what information, uh, thinking about dying, what information would you like to let the health professionals know? And so that could be going back to country. Um, it could be, I'd like to be at home rather than in hospital. Um, it could be, I would like to have, you know, a, the blessing of the sick. You know, all of those sorts of things are really important. Um, the, it's a follow-up question of would I recommend the online versions? Mm, yeah. um, the what we need is to have those documents available at the point of care for when someone's making treatment decisions. So online, the online versions such as the My Values website, which is amazing, it's fantastic, um, that definitely gives, you, gives the treating team an awareness of what your values and preferences are, but they need to know about it. They need to have it in the emergency department at three in the morning on Saturday night. So the online versions such as My Values are really good, but they're not legal forms because they're not signed and witnessed, et cetera, et cetera, by a medical practitioner. So I do recommend them as a way of doing the chat, um, of, of communicating about what your values and preferences are. If you want a legal document, unfortunately, we're still limited to the paper form, the signing, the witnessing with the, with the doctor. Yeah. Ooh. Yep, my values is www.myvalues.org.au. And that's actually done by a bunch of people down in um, Geelong in Victoria, which is really good. Now, here are some of the, um, the links that I've mentioned earlier. Um, Advanced Care Planning Australia um, is the peak body for advanced care planning and their, web, uh, their website is up there. It's really useful. It's got resources for health professionals and for patients and families. It's got different um, sections for each state, as I mentioned. So um, although if you're out of Victoria, um, you won't be using the term medical treatment decision maker, on that website, you'll be able to find the forms that are relevant for you. And on our um, advanced care planning internet page at Peter Mac, we've also got the Peter Mac advanced care planning brochure, and that's available in our top five languages as well. Um, and now I'm going to try to remember what they are. And I think it's simplified Chinese, Italian, Greek, Turkish and Vietnamese, but I could be wrong. There are top, it's in our top five languages anyway. And the other thing that I really wanted to mention was that there's quite a lot of people who've already done a medical power of attorney appointment or done some sort of advanced care planning documents before. And we really want you to send them in to us and then we'll attach it to your medical record and we'll put an alert on your medical record that says this person has done an advanced directive. 
And so if you're able to email them, um, that will come to me if you email it to advancedcareplanning at petermac.org. Or if you've got a hard copy, you can post it into our health information services team and they will scan that in a special advanced care planning section in your medical record. And um, then that will generate a flag so that if you are in the Royal Melbourne Hospital at three in the morning on Saturday night in the emergency department, they will be able to see that as well. Ooh. Great. Are there any more questions from our listeners online? Looks like, looks like that's it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much to everyone for coming today. We really appreciate your time. Um, so I can summarise in summary that advanced care planning is about thinking about your preferences and values in case you lose capacity to make decisions at any time in the future. And if you think about the different uh, components of advanced care planning, think about ACP. So A is appoint, choose the person that would make medical treatment decisions for you if you couldn't. Chat, talk about what your values and preferences are with your family and your medical treatment decision maker so they know what your wishes are. P is put it on paper. There's two forms. One is your medical treatment decision maker appointment. And the other form is an advanced directive, two types of advanced directive, values and instructional. But that's where you write down what your wishes and your preferences and your values could be. So after you've appointed someone, you've chatted to communicate, put it on paper, the next bit's the important bit as well. Make sure that copies of the documents are distributed so that they're available. If you become very unwell, they're at the point of care, so they will influence your care. Um, Great. So thanks very much. And um, Leanne says, thank you very much. And thank you, Holly, for sharing your personal story. And I wish you and your family all the best. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much, Holly. You no, really helped you. me a lot. That's great. It helps me a lot. Oh, sorry, you go. No, I just said thanks for letting me share my story. And yeah. Fantastic. No, you've helped me so much because sometimes when we talk about this stuff as doctors, we think, well, why, why aren't people doing it? Um, like, yeah. And so it's really so helpful for me to hear about your experience of, how we told you about it in a way yeah. that didn't grab you, that didn't make yeah. it sound like it's something that you should do. Yeah. Um, and then that's been really helpful for yeah. me in working out how to communicate with people about it. So that's fantastic. And just being explained in a different way. I'm now like, oh, my God, how did, why did I not listen? Like, yeah. Um, but now I'm like, yeah. Yeah, oh, I'm the same. Like um, when I give education about this, um, I think back to my two days that I spent you know, mm. with a sore bottom in the seminar room, listening to so many lectures about this and then walking out at the end, not really knowing what to do. Yeah. Um, so that simple approach, A, a point, C, chat, P, put it on paper. Um, yeah. You know, I think that that's, that's a Works well, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Perfect. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Happy Advanced Care Planning Week. <laughs>